Hello, I'm Agnes Thomas. Welcome to my home and the home where animals are fellow beings. I'd like to invite you to join me today and talk a little bit about communicating with animals, how it will enhance your life and your relationships with your pets, and how it will change your life. Won't you come in to my living room? This is my friend Lucky. Lucky is 20 years old and he is our official greeter. He's the first one to the door <laughs> when people come in. Turn around. I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about myself. I've always had an interest in animals. I've had a passion to know how people came to be the way they are, including animals. I wondered if animals have friends, if they have, if they feel grief and sorrow when someone moves away or if one of their animals die. My grandmother had a farm and I wondered if the farm animals were attached to each other or if they talked among, among themselves and what they had to say. What, Lucky? Oh, he just wants, he says, I'm okay, I just want to be petted some more. Okay, I'll pet you some more. I think it began when I was a child and we were first introduced to Walt Disney and Walt Disney cartoons. And uh, it was very fascinating to me that Huey, Dewey, and Louie and Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge had this relationship and it was very fascinating to me, and I extended that to all the animals that I came in contact with, which were mainly farm animals, cows and chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys and so on. And I was very, very interested in that. As I grew up, I still held that interest in how people came to be the way they are, and also how animals learned. <laughs> As an adult, I became a psychologist and a researcher, and I did many studies on how animals think. Studies like this are used to make inferences about how these processes may work in humans. And for me, I was interested in brain damaged and retarded individuals. And I was very interested if it was different for them, if they learned differently than other other humans. As I worked with animals, I got to know a great deal about how animals think, but it was nothing to what I was going to learn. In addition to being a mainstream scientist, I'm also a telepath. But let me say right at the outset, I'm not a psychic. A psychic is something completely different. I understand from those who are that the difference is they're able to tell the future. I cannot tell the future. They tell me that this is a gift that's given to them at birth. I don't have this gift. Telepathy, on the other hand, is a, a skill that is learned. It's something that you can teach others, which I'm going to give you a little demonstration about today. Let me tell you a little bit how I got into animal communication. I had an animal his name was Frosty, it was a cat, a male, and he contracted a tumor in his brain. And I took him to a, a, a veterinary oncologist, and the oncologist was successful in removing the tumor. The tumor was uh, a meningioma, which is uh, one that is formed from the meninges, which is a, co a, a tough covering that protects the brain. And as it pressed down, it caused Frosty to be blind. Frosty was fine for about five months after that, and his blindness returned. So I took him back to the oncologist, and they tested him again and tried to find out what had happened and why it returned. And one day they called me and said that there was, really wasn't anything more they could do for him. So I went to pick him up, and I was 
early and they didn't open till eight o'clock, so it was about quarter to eight. And I was sitting in a McDonald's restaurant having a cup of coffee and I was very distressed. And on the seat next to me, somebody had left a copy of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which is our local newspaper here. And I picked it up and I started to read. And there was an article in it about a woman in New York who could talk to animals. And she could do this over the phone. The dis distance was not an issue. So I picked up Frosty and I went home. And as I did this, he started to get worse. And by late afternoon, he was unconscious. And as I had him in my lap, I either had the choice of taking him back to having him put down or searching for a miracle. So I decided to go for the miracle. And I called this woman and I asked her if she would talk to Frosty. And his commu her communications with Frosty were very, very helpful. Frosty said something like this, that he was in communication with his mate, Missy, who is uh, the little female that they had a litter with um, about 15 years earlier. And, he, and I asked him if he was going to get well, if he knew what was wrong with him and if he could get well. And he said, I'm not concerned about my physical life. I'm concerned about my spiritual one. And I was very astonished at that, by that. And then I said to him, well, is there something that we can do to make you well? And uh, Dawn, who was the communicator, said, Frosty exists on a very high spiritual plane. And he wants you to know that he, you have done everything that you can for him. And that he's very proud of you. You're his mommy, and he thinks that you are a very good doctor, and you know a lot about animals. So then, subsequently, a few, weeks, um, a few days later, actually, Frosty passed away. And I was just beside myself. The pain in my heart was just unbelievable. And I contacted Frosty in the spirit world. I called her back uh, to thank her for what she did and for talking to Frosty for me. And she said, oh, no, no, Frosty doesn't want you to cry. You need to talk to Frosty. And I said, is that possible? And she said, oh, yes, yes. So I had a consultation with her, and she talked to Frosty in spirit form. And I asked Frosty, how he was doing and he said I'm I'm resting right now and I said Frosty were you scared when you were in the hospital and he said no I wasn't scared daddy was with me the whole time and so I wasn't scared daddy meaning my hu my late husband who died about six months prior to that and I was very fascinated that he could see spirit as he was in the hospital I said to him, Frosty, do you know how much the veterinarians and the doctors that worked on you and the veterinary nurses loved you? Everybody just fell in love with you. And he said something very interesting to me. He said, Mommy, I was supposed to do that. That was my mission. His mission? What A mission? An animal has a mission? Well, my imagination just ran wild. Cats not only can talk, they have missions. They, his, his answers to me when I talked to him about his illness had medical content. They had medical insight. It was, it was astounding. And I just had to learn more about how this worked. So I went to study with people that knew how to do it. I traveled all around the country to study with people that could talk to animals so that I could learn how to do it and I was very astonished. I studied this like I would any other academic discipline. I, I listened, I took the information that I was given. We had a lot of practice sessions to do this and I integrated it into the scientific background that I was familiar with so that it was believable to me. Then I researched it to see how it was actually done and what communication actually is. And I found out that communication with animals is really telepathy in its purest form. And that's what I made a study of. Telepathy is the natural ancient language of the people of the earth. 
In ancient times, people recognized the inseparable unity of creator and creation. They blended themselves with the universal presence, power, and purpose, which is forever moving back of all things, in all things, and through all things. To them, life was an all-inclusive kinship in which nothing was meaningless, nothing was unimportant, and from which nothing could be excluded. Every single thing was perfect and in its right place. At one time, everything was in rational correspondence with everything else. Everything moved in full accord, not only with everything else, but with the cosmic plan itself. Native Americans still hold this view and revere it. I discovered that everyone still has this ability, but we've forgotten how to use it. We intuit things all the time, but we doubt ourselves, or more often, we're too embarrassed to let people know what we are thinking or feeling for fear of being ridiculed. We can restore this skill by learning a little more about how it works. What exactly is telepathy? Telepathy is transfer of thought from one being to another through extrasensory perception. What is actually being communicated is a composite of all that being thinks and feels and sees and hears and smells and tastes at any given moment in time. That thought ball, which is referred to a thought ball by Talbot and other scientists, it passes from the sender to the receiver. The receiver see receives it. It has to be decoded. It has to filter up through your own brain. And it has to be translated into language so that it can be understood and communicated to another. I'm going to give you a little demonstration of how that works. Telepathy is not language in itself. If you sit and relax for a moment, where does telepathy reside in the brain? It resides in the realm of imagination. It doesn't mean it's imaginary, but that's where it sits, and I'll demonstrate this in a moment. The word imagination comes from the Greek word imago, which means to create a duplicate or a likeness in the mind. Now, if you're ready, I'll give you a simple demonstration how of an impression gets translated into language. I'm going to create an impression, and I'm going to transmit it to you verbally. So if you just quiet your mind and just listen. There is a portion of food on a white 9-inch plate. It has been cut into a V-shape. There is an upper crust and a lower crust. Between the crusts, there is something that looks like sliced fruit. It smells like apples, cinnamon, nutmeg, and sugar. It appears to be warm because there is a ball of creamy white stuff on top which is melting. This impression creates an image in your mind's eye, or by your mind's eye, I mean across the stream of your consciousness. You can see it when your eyes are closed. Now open your eyes and continue to see the image. That's what it will be like if you telepathically communicate. The image will be there, but it will be almost in a memory or an imaginary form. Notice that even though the words were not spoken, the words apple pie a la mode popped into your mind. That's how an impression gets translated into language. I did not speak those words, apple pie a la mode. But you instantly recognized it and turned it into words so that you could remember it. 
Now close your eyes and look at the impression again. Are you receiving any taste, any texture, any scent? Are, is your mouth watering? Are there any associations with the, that you're making with it? Do you have a feeling of satisfaction? Pleasure? Are you making an association between your apple pie slice and a fall day when your mother made it for you? Or grandmother at Thanksgiving time? All those associations are bands of energy that are tied to that image. It's not unlike the heart connection. It's an energy band that brings those associations back to the image of the apple pie. Now close your eyes again and we'll try another one. Think of one of your pets. Create an image of your pet with your eyes closed. What impression are you receiving? Can you see the image of the animal across the screen of your consciousness? What is it doing? The animal does not need to be present for this exercise. What feeling are you picking up from your animal? Is it warmth or affection? Are you picking up anything that looks like radiance? Do you have a feeling of comfort? Are you perceiving playfulness in the animal? Or just joy? Now open your eyes and continue to see the image across the screen of your consciousness. Can you still experience the feeling with your eyes open as you look at the image? If you pictured your own pet, you are getting an impression of the animal at this moment. Thoughts do not come up in someone's mind out of nowhere. If you intended to connect with one of your pets, you did. And the impression you received was as much as you're able to get at this moment. But it is from the pet. Let me explain a little bit about the heart connection. This is something that you can actually see, telepaths see it with inner vision, and with a little training you can see it also all the time. The best way I think I can describe it, it's like a distortion of air above a heat source. As you have a candle and it's lit, the fire makes the air expand. And as the air expands, it also rises because warm air is lighter than cool air. And as this happens, the air will change. And as it's changing and moving, as the light hits it, it bends it in a different direction than it was previously. And what you do is, when you connect with an animal, you connect first with the person's voice, and then you look for the heart connection and you can see this from the person and you use that to locate the animal because most of these consultations are done over the phone. When you trace it to the animal, then what happens is the amp, since the animal is connected to the person, it opens it up to everything that the animal 
is connected to and the animal is connected to everything. So what appears before you as soon as you contact the animal is a web-like structure. It looks like a net covering the earth both in the horizontal and in vertical dimensions. You see every, everything that the animal is connected to, the rest of the family, friends, other animals, uh, plants, anything that is of significance to that animal. The bonds are very strong and you can see them. If you have a pet that is from a shelter, you can see if he still has an attachment or bonds to the previous family and who, uh, what members of that family. You can actually see the members that he is still connected to, usually children. These energy bands have been studied by scientists, in particular um, David Bohm, the physicist, Rupert Sheldrake, who is a biologist from Great Britain, and even Bruce Cathy has met, has, uh, well actually, um, Rupert Sheldrake turned them morphogenetic fields, that's what he calls them. And Bruce Cathy um, was able to actually work out the mathematics of it. One of my kitties is walking through. Um, Lynn McTaggart claims that she has found that, that, is, that these invisible bands are what connect all life with each other. It can connect a cell with another cell, that's how a cell communicates, a cell with an organ system, a organ system with another organ system, a cell with the entire body. These little invisible bands connect everything that's alive. Animals refer to these grids simply as the heart connection. But it's very interesting because they have other functions that we didn't know about till now. The ancient ancients used these grids to communicate with each other telepathically. For example, no, it's been a mystery for some time how African drumming really worked. There weren't enough sounds in the drum, in the drum beat, and the drumming itself to be decoded as any kind of verbal language. What the drumming actually did was not communicate language. It put the people, or the natives, in a spontaneous altered state, and they communicated with other tribes through mental telepathy. The drum actually only served as a signal, just like your phone ringing, for you to stop what you're doing and listen. And when they did, they connected with other tribes, and the other tribes gave them information about warnings, about um, a storm coming, or some other thing that was going on, if the village was being attacked or something. This is how they communicated. It really did not have anything to do with the drumming itself. The drumming will put you in a spontaneous altered state. And by an altered state, I mean a deep state of meditation. And the meditation is simply having a clear and quiet mind and just letting random thoughts disappear. That's all it was. I suspect that even the Indian smoke signals were used for the same reason. They were just signals to tell a neighboring tribe about what was going on. But the signal itself was not used for um, any kind of verbal language. It was used to tell them to be quiet and to listen so they could pay attention to incoming messages in their mind. I'd like to talk to you a little bit now about some of the telepathic communications that I've had with pets. Some of them are quite important. A lot of them are simple, like um, a lot of your calls will be about um, the cats peeing or dogs biting, but some of them are quite profound and they're, they're quite valuable. For example, I had a client who called because she wanted to know if her dog was ready to be put down. It hadn't drank or ate for several days. It was very emaciated, it was dehydrated, and it was just laying on the floor. And when you, when you talk to an animal, when you connect with an animal, there's a certain amount of light that you get. And I usually evaluate it on a, on a scale of 1 to 10 with 10 being a very young, vibrant animal, like a puppy. And 
a five being perhaps um, an animal seven or eight years old that's still very healthy and is doing well. It's like having uh, your light on a dimmer switch. The dimmer the light that comes from the animal, the, lo the closer you know they are to the end of their life. When they get to be a two or a one, you can hardly see them anymore. You can hardly connect with their light. And you know they need to be put down. So I connected with this dog and he his light was about um, a four, and I knew it was not his time to die. And I asked the dog, I said, your mom wants to know if you want to be put down, if you want to be put and released from your body. And he said, no, I'm trying to tell her that the water's no good. And I said to this lady, your dog says, first of all, your dog's not ready to be put down, and second, he says your water's no good. And she said, well, I don't know what he means. And I said, well, and the dog said it again, the water's no good. So I said, what kind of water do you have? And she said, well, I have well water. I said, you know what, maybe there's something wrong with the do water and the dog's not drinking because he's trying to tell you something. Do you have any chicken soup or something in the house, just broth? She said, yes, I do. So she, she opened a can of broth and sure enough, the dog drank. And I said, you know what, I think you should go to the store, get some bottled water, and try and give it to the dog. Will you do that and then call me back? And she did. And she said that she brought two gallons of uh, water. She gave it to the dog, and he drank almost all of it. He just drank and drank and drank and drank. And I said to her, you know, the dog is trying to tell you something. I think he's trying to tell you that the water is contaminated. And he's aware of it because that's all he gets to drink whereas you have milk and fruit and juices and pop and other beverages. So you're not only just drinking water and you're not feeling it, but he's feeling it. So she had her water tested and she called me back a week later and said that the water had E. coli in it. And it was very, very lucky for the whole community that the dog was able to communicate that message to her. And the dog is alive and well today and so are the rest of the village. Another example, um, a man called me because his dog was pick, uh, digging holes in the backyard, you know, as dogs will do. And I said, well, what, what do you want me to say or to do? And he says, just tell him to stop it. Well, telling an animal to stop it is about as good as telling a child to stop. You can't just stop a behavior. You have to replace it with another behavior. And so I talked to the dog and I said, um, what's going on? What's with digging holes in the backyard? And he said to me, um, well, I'm looking for the body. And I said, what body? And he said that he was their previous dog, uh, who was a Dalmatian. And this one was a part Dalmatian, part Labrador, a black Labrador. And he said, he showed me that he died uh, right after the baby was born. And he said that he was too lively of a dog for the family at that time. And he wanted to be a quieter dog so that he could interact with the baby. So he passed away and uh, he, he wanted to know where they put his body, his old body, because it came back right away as this new dog. So I said, oh, so I asked the man, I said, where did you put uh, the remains of the, of the former dog? And he said, we buried it at my father-in-law's house. And so I said, I think your dog would like to see where their remind, uh, the remains are. Would you be willing to do that? And he said, oh, sure. So he did. He took the dog to see the remains. And I told the dog that there won't be anything really there to see because the body will be decomposed and there may be a few bones, but they're deep under the earth, and you know your dad's not going to pick them up. And so he agreed, and they did. They took him to see the, the, the grave of the previous body, and the dog stopped digging holes in the backyard. Those are, like, those are typical animal communications, and a lot of them are very poignant. A lot of them are very sad. Some of them are from animals that are in the spirit world. And it's very, very important to let the person know how the animal crossed over into the spirit world. And usually in about 90% of the cases when I contact an animal in the spirit world, they show me how they got there. 
They usually die in their owner's arms, or their person's arms, and from the, uh, their arms, the spirit is lifted up and taken to the um, afterlife by an angel, almost 90% of the time. And when they get to the spirit world, they are in a place that looks like um, looks like a really nice playground, and they're usually accompanied, or they're usually met there by members of the family. And I see this across the screen of my consciousness, and when that happens, I just describe who they're with. I don't know who these people are, but I'll say he's with a man who is about five foot four. He's, he looks like he weighs about 140 pounds. He has brown hair and he has a brown mustache. And um, they'll say, oh, that's my father who is on the other side, or they usually know. Uh, once I had a conversation with a fish uh, for my friend, and he uh, he told me, oh, oh no, it was a dog, I'm sorry. I was talking to a fish, and he also had a dog that was on the, in the spirit world. And I talked to the dog, and there was a lady that came forward, and she had sort of medium hair, it was like a, a dishwater blonde, and she was slender, and she looked very um, professional. and uh, she had a message for the person the, uh, that I was contacting through. And I said, um, who are you? He didn't know who, who she was. He said, I don't know anybody in the, in the afterlife. I don't know anybody in the spirit world. And so I asked her, who are you? And she said, I taught him to play piano. And I said, oh, this lady says that she taught you to play piano. And he said, oh, my old music teacher, you're right. She does look that way. I had no idea she passed away. And I said, well, she's here with your dog because she's using this opportunity to get a message through to you. And uh, I asked, what is the message? And her message to him at the time was to continue with his music, that there were great things ahead of him, if, provided he continued with his music. These are some of the communications that you'll receive. Each one is very different. Each one is very tender. Um, animals will never say anything that is um, coarse or will hurt you or will interfere with your own beliefs. For example, if you ask an animal about reincarnation, usually they say yes. Animals reincarnate and they usually come back to you. They do it as easily as we breathe. But if you ask an animal if they're going to come back and the person or their owner doesn't believe in reincarnation, they won't answer you. Now, I've asked many animals um, about coming back and when they come back, they want to come back to you. Well, how do, you, how do they find you and how do you find them? And one of the things that happens is they will, they will come to the person in a dream, usually. Uh, somehow they will get a message to you that they're back. And you'll have a dream about them. And then they will contact me and I will help them to find them. And the animal would say where they are and how to find them. For example, Frosty, the one that, that died, wanted to come back. And I asked, um, how will I find you? And he said, um, that, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Frosty, it was Puff. It was Puff. Puff was a, uh, an orange fluffy kitty that I had, and he wanted to come back. And I said, Where, how will I find you? And he said, um, I'll be in, there, I'll be, I'm about three weeks old, I'm back. I'll be in, ready to be picked up in about three more weeks. There'll be an ad in the paper that says, kittens free to good home and I'm with a family where there are two young girls they look with long blonde hair and they look to be about five and seven years old and uh, the mother cat is an orange and black and white patches and all the kittens are orange and black and white patches except me I'm all orange and he said this was an accidental pregnancy the mother cat got out and got pregnant and I'm about a mile from your home. So I said, okay. Well, in about three weeks, I started to look at all the local papers. 
and um, I was and I found two ads that were for cats. One, uh, I called and they said yes, we have orange cats and so on. But I went to their house, and they had kittens everywhere. This was an elderly couple. The woman had Alzheimer's disease, and she loved animals, and she wanted to have all these animals around, so he allowed it. But they had cats everywhere. Um, but they didn't have any children, so it wasn't the right home. So then I went, I found another ad where they had one orange kitten. And they went to the, I went to the house, and it was just one kitten, but it was a female. And Puff said that he was a male. So as I'm at the house, I'm thinking, okay, well, I just can't keep running around town every ad that I see. So a few days later, I was in the lab working, and I read in the News Herald, which is another local paper in Cleveland, that there uh, were a group of kittens born. So I called, and this time I played the psychologist over the phone, and I get all my questions over the phone. I said, uh, do you have any kittens? And she says, yes, we have seven. I said, well, uh, do you have any that are pure orange? And she says, yes, we have one. And I said, do you have any kittens that are um, black and white and orange patches? And they go, yes. I said, is the mother black and white and orange patches? She goes, yes. And I said, do you have two daughters that, are, that are, have long blonde hair that are about five and seven? And she says, well, they're six and eight. <laughs> so, and she says, how do you know this? And I didn't want to tell her that I was an animal communicator. I want I, I was kind of, I felt kind of silly, and I didn't want her to refuse to give me the kitten. So I said, um, I had a dream. She says, Oh, you're right on it. And I said, Where are you Where are you located? And she says, I'm on Drenick, and I'm just. She was about a mile from me, and I said, It's okay if I come over and see the kitten. She said, Well, the orange one is promised, and I said, Well, can I come anyway? So I went. I put a sign on my door that said emergency and I closed the lab and I took off like a shot and I went to see the kittens and sure enough it was Puff because when I first set eyes on Puff he said yes it's me mommy but he had been promised to someone else and so I played with the kitten for a while and it was a very nice family and the girls were darling and the lady was very sweet and I gave her a real sob story that my husband had just died and you know, I was lonely, and I, my kitty died, and I wanted another kitty, even though I already had five at the time. But I really wanted to get Puff back. And she said, well, you know, it's been promised to our cousin, and I can't really give it to you uh, unless I talk to my uncle. So I said, okay. So I left, and I went home, and I called two other animal communicators to validate that it was actually Puff, and they agreed, yes, it is Puff. So I waited. And about 7 o'clock, um, the man called me back and he said, uh, we talked to the uncle and the uncle said nothing doing. The cat has been promised to uh, my son. And I was just shattered. And, Ma and uh, Puff said to me, don't worry, Mommy, I was intended for you and nothing can stand in that, that way. So I was very devastated, but he said, let me uh, call you back uh, in a couple hours. So I called back in a couple hours, and he uh, said that he had talked to the boy, this, the cousin, who was supposed to get Puff. And he explained the situation, and that I really wanted this cat, and I was a widow, and the whole nine yards. And uh, this, the cousin said, okay, if it means that much to her, then let her have him. And so he said, you can pick him up. So he said, now don't drive crazy. He'll be here, nobody will take him, and I went and I got him, and I was thrilled. And I asked him, and I've asked many animals, when you come from the spirit world, who assigns you to your person that you're going to be with? How is that done? Is it the angel that assigns you and tells you, or is it, because they are actually appointed to you. And I said, is it the angel that does that, or is it God? And they say they're not allowed to say. So they don't, though there are certain things that animals are not allowed to tell us about spirit. I'd like to talk to you a little bit and explain how animals think 
Animals think very differently than humans. Their world is non-dual, non-linear, non-judgmental, and they are not aware of space-time concepts. Time itself um, it exists in the present moment for them. And by time, I mean they know when supper time is. They know daytime versus nighttime. But that's all. They live very much in the present moment. When you connect with an animal and you get used to talking with them, just being with them the way they think is a transcendental experience in and of itself. For example, you're going to see on the screen this chart on how animals think. In general, I'll talk about each of these. When you talk to an animal, you know that it's coming from the animal by the speed of the answer. Okay. Animals give you a very rapid, very, it, it really takes maybe only um, a millionth of a second for their answer to come back to you. So for example, if you ask them a question, you get the answer back before you even get the question out of your mouth. It's that fast. It's because you're connecting with spirit and you're not connecting with the brain. Okay? Otherwise, how could you connect with an animal in the afterlife with no body and no brain? So you're connecting with spirit. Their answers are very fast. As humans, as they give you an answer, they have to contemplate, they have to put something together, and then they give you an answer. Their answers are slow. That formulating takes time. Animals' answers tend to be very simple. Humans' answers are very complex because they encompass their perception, their preferences, and their feelings at the time of the answer. For example, I had an animal who uh, was put to sleep by a husband uh, who was very angry with his wife. And when the animal got to the spirit world, it was with an angel. And it, I couldn't hear what the angel was saying because she was at too high of a level. But I heard what the animal was, was a dog. And I heard the, what the animal was hearing. And she said something like, don't let resentment go into your heart because it'll keep you from finding love in the future. And so the dog said, I spit it out. Just that simple. Animals believe that they are connected with all life. They know that the whole universe is a part of them and they are a part of it. Humans believe they're separate. Animals are non-judgmental. Humans are judgmental. But there is a reason for that. A human has to create his own identity within the physical world. And in order to do that, you need dualities, you need contrasts. So if a woman is taking on fair, uh, feminine characteristics, she'll want to compare the characteristics of her mother with her sister or with her aunts or other women. And she will pick and choose attributes she would like to have for herself. That requires judgment and contrast. Animals do not experience dualities. And dualities, I mean black versus white, pain versus pleasure, heat versus cold. And the reason they don't is because they're really on a continuum. Where does black not become black and start to become gray? And where does white not become white and start to become gray? Where do those two meet? Where, where do you define gray? It's on a continuum. Where do heat and cold meet? Where they become warm? Or is one degree not warm? Or is one degree higher, warmer? Where on that continuum? So animals live on that. It's almost like Zen Buddhism where you take the middle path. Um, they also don't have priorities. Humans have priorities. And the reason they do is humans were given the gift of co-creation. And that is one of the, the wonderful qualities about being human, is expressing your creativity. But in order to create something new, you need to have contrast. 
and you need to say, I like this better than this. So you have to have value judgments, and you have to prioritize things. Which things are more important? So if you look at a variety of things within the realm of what you're studying or what you're creating, how do you put that together and make it a priority? If you're an artist, how do you prioritize what your background color is going to be? Things like that. Because they don't have priorities, you don't hear st statements from animals like uh, complaining about pain versus pleasure. For example, if you ask a human how they're feeling, they'll say, I have a thorn in my side, I have a thorn in my side, or I have this cut in my finger, and they, it will be number one on the list of their priorities. If you ask an animal how you, they feel, they will say, I'm fine. And you say, are you in pain anywhere? And they'll say, yes, I have a broken leg. But they don't place a value on that. They experience pain, but they experience it as an experience. They'll say to themselves, oh, this is what it's like to have a broken leg. This is what it's like to be old. They won't say, oh, I'm getting old and I don't feel as well anymore, because they don't have priorities. Animals live in a state of timelessness. They are not part of a world where there are clocks and there are schedules and programs and agendas. They simply are. They just are. So they're always present in the, in the present moment. And they experience life as it comes. Humans do experience time. They are time bound. And part of the reason they do that is that so they can have some sort of way of storing information in memory in terms of time sequence. Research shows that humans have a lot of random activity going on in their mind all the time. 70% of what humans think about during the day concerns fears of the future. Usually, if they're going to be well, if they're going to have enough money, if they'll have enough save for their children to go to college, um, where they can go on a vacation next time because they'll need a rest. 20% of what they think about are regrets about the past, their memories, their, they dwell on mistakes they made, they dwell on things that are gone, and 10% of their time is being in the present moment. When you talk to an an animal, the content of their conversation is benevolent. It's always loving. It's always beneficial for you. It is very noticeable. With a human, the content will vary. It will vary uh, according to the situation they're in, according to the person they're with. So it's v highly variable. It depends on how much that person would want to share with you about themselves. Certainly if they talk to their mother, they're going to talk very different than they do a neighbor. They will talk very differently with a neighbor than they do their spouse. You have all these hats that you wear. Animals see themselves as spirit helpers. Humans see themselves as their ego or their body. They are bound to the physical dimension. They have to have that. They have to have an ego to operate within the physical dimension. They have to have a concept of self and a concept of purpose in order to carry out their daily activities. Animals know that they are connected to the universe and connected to all things. They are a part of the universal plan. Humans see themselves as self-contained. They're a little walking universe within themselves and they relate to the outside world as outside of them. Animals know that they are eternal because they remember their previous lives. Mortals, or uh, humans, think that they're mortal because they see death as an end point. And, it, 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 and it's variable whether in their belief system they believe in a life after death. But they know that the physical body is mortal. Animals believe that all is as it should be. Humans, because they're only within themselves, think the world needs to be fixed. 
there's something wrong with it. Uh, it ought to work like they think. Um, they think they have it all figured out. Animals have a unified perspective that we're all together, we're all one. Humans operate from a singular vantage point, and let me explain what I mean by this. You have a concept of how the world works, and if you ever go to see a holographic picture, a holographic picture has lines, lines um, of either plastic or glass, grooves, and it bends the light. And as you start at one place on the holographic picture, you are at one vantage point. But all you have to move is just a little tiny bit, and you have another vantage point. Because as the light hits these grooves, it shows the picture in a different um, way. And you, as you keep going along these lines, you'll see that every vantage point, the picture will change. So then your brain has to reassess and reevaluate what you're actually seeing, even though the picture itself is stationary. Your brain ha works like that. So the more you know and the more you see, the, the broader your uh, scope of awareness and the greater your understanding. So as you do this, you see that uh, your perception of the world is changed and it is dependent upon your vantage point and your state of awareness. For animals, love is unconditional. It is the bond that, that connects all of us. For humans, it, love is conditional. Haven't you ever wondered why animals are so attractive to humans, why you're so drawn to them? It's because of their unconditional love. Humans, no matter how much they love their pet, they still have some conditions attached to it. For example, the animal is expected to go in the litter box, or it's expected to uh, relieve itself out of doors. There are some conditions, no matter how close you are to your animal. If you look at the left side of this column now, and compare the things, and you summarize, you can see that on the left side of this column, it can be summed up into certain things, certain words, love, truth, and facts. Now if you look on the right side of the column, you see that everything is dependent on the way the ego has trans, uh, translated knowledge and experience. A person in the United States will have total different knowledge and experience than someone far across the other part of the world. If you see this, you will see that humans, their thoughts and their understanding is based on preferences, personal preferences, and all they can give you is opinions. And by that, uh, to give you an example of that, when you do research, you, what you're really studying is a sample. Supposing I wanted to know if women um, from Asia were more tra uh, preferred um, silver jewelry to gold jewelry. Okay, simple thing. And you have 25 women as, you, as your sample. And 24 out of the 25 prefer gold jewelry. That doesn't mean that I can make a statement about all Asian women because I have not measured all Asian women. I've only measured a sample, a particular sample. So all I can have is not a research fact. I can't present that as Asian women prefer gold jewelry because I have not measured them all. All I can say is it appears that s w women, based on my sample, prefer gold jewelry. So it's simply an opinion. You can never have a fact. In 1954, there was a man named J. Allen Boone. He, w he probably was one of the first animal communicators to actually write about this. He was a movie producer in his own right. 
and he was asked one day to babysit or to pet sit for an animal, a dog called Strongheart. Strongheart was a very famous actor dog, and he was uh, his his persons had to go out of town, and they asked Boone if he would baby he would if he would sit for him, and they gave him very careful instructions how to treat this dog. You're to read him poetry. You're to treat him like he's a human being. You're to give him so much food or do this or that. And Boone never had a dog, but he agreed. And Boone found that as long as he treated Strongheart like he was a dog, the dog would communicate with him in sort of a pantomime. He would sort of act out an answer. But he noticed that the dog got to know his comings and goings very well. And when he had an intention to go fishing, the dog would bring in his fishing clothes, his fishing gear and everything into the room. He was very interested in how Strongheart got to be such a famous actor. It seemed as he was filming uh, this dog that the dog knew the script. He, he acted just exactly on cue. He did everything just right. They didn't have to do a second and third take. And he, he just couldn't understand how this dog understood the script so well without knowing the language. So as he spent a month or two with this dog, he started to really uh, understand him. And once he started to respect Strong Heart and treat him as a fellow being, he began to receive communications from him, telepathic communications, which he, he called at the time thought transfer. And he got into these deep conversations with Strong Heart. And when his attitude changed toward the dog, a whole new awareness opened up to Boone. He found that behind every object there was a spiritual fact, what he called a spiritual fact, or an essence. And this essence extended beyond each object on all sides and in every direction. And this essence was in all forms, and it connected each form with another. Once he started to talk with animals, with uh, Strongheart, he also found he was able to talk to plants and trees and rocks and oceans and rivers and anything that was alive. And he found that everything was alive. He was very fascinated by this and he was a little bit overwhelmed and also a little bit frightened to say what he was experiencing and what he was feeling. So he sought out the wisdom of uh, an American, a Native American Indian by the name of Mojave Dan. Dan was also known as the Desert Rat. He lived out in the desert and his family consisted of several dogs and some burros and an occasional wild animal that would take up residence with them for a few nights and then go on. So he went out there and uh, wise men of the Indians usually don't say a lot, but when they're ready to talk, they talk. So he was there about three days and he was very patiently waiting for Dan to give him some words of wisdom. And he sat there and sat there and sat there. And so finally, Dan says to him, there's facts about dogs, and then there's opinions. If you want the facts, go get it straight from the dog. If you want opinions, go to humans. That was his advice. And it's true. Dogs have the facts because they see all things, because they're connected to everything. When you connect with an animal, you're connecting with the universal mind. When you, when you want opinions, you go to, hum, to humans because, like we discussed before, humans only see a portion of what's out there, and they can only give you an opinion based on what they know or they've experienced. Welcome back. 
We are at the home of my friend, Dr. Maya Maslinski, and we're here to show you a little demonstration of how an, uh, a consultation actually works. This is her cat, Zoe. Hi, Zoe, my little girl. And Maya, can you tell us how you came to be, how uh, Zoe came to be in your family? Sure. Well, I have been thinking about getting a pet, a small pet, for a while. We've always had dogs. I've never had a cat, actually. Um, and I decided, one afternoon, I decided to go to local um, APL center. It's an animal protective league shelter, animal shelter here in Cleveland. Um, and I was there looking for a small dog, puppy, preferably. So um, I went there. I went there actually twice looking for a small dog, and uh, I just couldn't find one. Um, and uh, the room, the next room, uh, was filled with cats. There were so many of them, small ones, older ones. Um, and I decided to stop by and just look around. And uh, I just, I will never forget that I saw this beautiful face sitting in one of the cages in the back just looking at me with those big eyes and I was so tempted to hold her so I opened the cage and and I decided to hold her and she started purring right away and it gave me such a comforting nice feeling and I've never experienced that because as I said I've never had a cat um, so I was holding her and she was holding on to me so tightly and she was so content purring all the time and I was trying to put her up to see her face and she was she would not let me she was holding on so tightly and I thought that was different was she clinging to your she shirt was, yeah she was clinging um, so I took her outside and I spoke with one of the ladies who works in APL and uh, just trying to get some information about Zoe and she says well unfortunately we don't know much about her other than she is uh, four months old and that she's a female <laughs> And uh, and that was it. So uh, I was just, I decided she's so special. And I had the bond with her right away. And I decided to bring her home. It's OK, honey. And uh, I brought her home. And my husband was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> he was expecting a dog. And uh, he says, OK, well, she's so pretty. Um, he loved her right away, too. What we noticed right in the beginning was that Zoe was very anxious. She actually still is slightly anxious, but she was very anxious in the beginning. She was hiding behind couches and armoire and various other places, and I thought she had a difficult time adjusting to a new environment, so I asked Agnes for help, <laughs> and uh, so you helped us a yeah. lot. and. And we came over, I came over, and uh, we talked with this little darling, and we found out that she had a very nice family who had her before, and that they loved her very much, but they were never home. Mm -hmm. And she really went through a stage, she was there as a kitten, and she went through a stage where she actually did not know how to play. Mm -hmm. She was very timid, um, she was afraid of strangers, but... Uh, I assured her that this would be her permanent home and she liked that idea that she was going to be here mm -hmm. and then I talked to her a little about her shyness and she says well I I don't know what you mean and I said well how about if your mom gets you some toys and then you got her some toys and a string and I said your mommy will show you how to play and also, you can look out the windows to see the animals outside. She'll put a, a couch there or something for you to sit on, and you can look outside. And she was, it, she started to come around. Uh, at first, what, what did she do at first? Did she crawl up to you on, you left her be. Yes. And then she started to crawl up with yes. you as you were mm -hmm. watching TV? Yes, right. She would come up and rub against us, you know. Initially, she wouldn't come up on my lap, but she would just rub against my legs and she would give some meows and squeaks. <laughs> Little shy ones in the beginning. Um, did she, then did she, I'm sorry, did she come up uh, when you called her for dinner? No, initially she didn't. She, she did have a good appetite, she did eat, but she, 
she didn't want to respond to her name or anything. But then, with some time, um, she did. She started to. And how long have you had Zoe? I've had her for several months now. And how is she now? Is she friendly? Um, yes. Has she come up to your husband? And yes, and she's actually they play all the time. It's very cute to see them playing. He loves her. Oh, he does. He ad uh, she adopted and him. She adopted him, <laughs> as cats often do, I learned. I've learned many things about cats, and uh, I'm just so happy she's with us. And um, She is a darling. It was a, a special day for me, I thought. It, I feel that it was meant to be. Um, she brings so much joy to our family, and we love her. Mm -hmm. She's much more com comfortable now with us. And We've talked to um, Zoe a few times about her past, her past life, and the family, and she was attached to her former family. Um, her biggest uh, fear coming here was, am I going to have to move again? And it's hard for them to make an attachment and then um, have to break the attachment. And the way you handle that in a, in a client interview and in a consultation with an animal is you ask the animal to show you the other family, and they will show you a picture of the other family. You'll see who they're bonded to. Mm -hmm. And you will give them an opportunity to say goodbye. And Zoe said something like, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think she said something like, thank you for having me, and I had a good time, um, but I'm going to be with another family now, and goodbye. And it, all they need is that opportunity to say goodbye. What kinds of things does Zoe like to do now? She loves to play. Uh, morning time and evening time is the play time for her. Um, actually, she, um, when we get up in the morning and getting ready to go to work, um, she's standing by the door ready to play. She's very vocal in the morning. She talks, well, in, in cat. <laughs> she meows and squeaks and she's so happy and cheerful. Um, and then she runs around the house trying to get her attention to trying to make her chase her and play with her. And she does the same thing in evening time when we come back from work. Um, and she's very friendly. She, I think she's quite happy. I hope she is. Well, let's ask her. Zoe? Yes, she says she feels very comfortable here. And this is her place now. Not yours anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and that um, she especially likes looking out windows. Do you have a window, a couple of windows that are open that she can look yes. out during the day? Yes, we do it all the time and she loves it. Um, as soon as we get up in the morning, we open the windows and uh, we have the screen, so she's not able to get out. But she enjoys looking at the birds and little squirrels and chipmunks and various other small things. And she's enjoying it. She likes the smell. She loves to sit and watch, watch the outside. Yes, I see yeah. her in a forested area. Yeah. There must be a lot of uh, birds and yes. chipmunks and yes. things for her to see. Yes. Uh, are there any deer or anything? Nearby? Yes, many, many actually. And our neighbor <laughs> feeds the deer and you help them out. I know there is a mother with a little... With the fawn, with the they come by. They come by. Yeah, she's my them out. friend and also my neighbor. Yeah. And Zoe here loves to sit on the couch in the um, den and look out the front window at me. Yes. And, and when I she pass sees by, she sees my cats and, and she watches me in the kitchen window. And uh, she'll sit there all day. And there are, are an array of feral cats that come by and they yes. all stop to say hello. And she's, yes. she sits there and meows at them. Yeah. So tell me, uh, with the, between a dog and a cat, how how different are they for you? Okay. I've never had a dog, so mm -hmm. how how different is it? Mm -hmm. I think they are very different. I think they both are very loving and as as you speak very uh, frequently, unconditional love. And I think it applies to both of both of, um, dogs and cats. Um, but I think their behavior is different. Um, I find. Uh, well, my cat, the only cat I know, really, to be uh, very independent, um, very independent, and she likes to do things at her own time, 
things that she likes to do. You cannot really force her to do anything. You cannot make her do anything if she doesn't want to. And, and that's not quite the case with dogs. Dogs will do anything to please you and, um, or to get a treat or to be pet. Um, Zoe doesn't do those things. Go ahead. <laughs> well, she's just, it's just, she's very easy to, uh, as a pet, she doesn't, we don't need to walk her. <laughs> That's the, you know, main, main thing in the winter time. You need to walk the dog and it's, um, have so you ever it's very easy to take care of. How, have you ever, ta have you taken her to the vet? How is she in the car? Well, she was anxious in the car a little bit, I think, um, at the first time, but then uh, we had her in the car a few times, a few other times, and she was, I think she, she's still very young, and I think she can learn a lot. Um, as she's more exposed to certain situations, she's more comfortable in them, and um, she's not too bad in the car, actually, surprisingly. How, how is it with a dog in the car? Um, that no problem with the dog. Me, honey? Yeah, she, Come on, baby. She, yeah, she calls me Aunt Agnes. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> she is friendly, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> um, dogs are different. They will follow you anywhere. They, they follow you anywhere. Do they wait Think for cues from you to... I know that dogs read intentions. Mm -hmm. All animals read your intentions. Do they wait to get cues from you for what they're going to do? Yes, they do. But a cat it's is different. Different. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, um, they don't cooperate as much. <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. It. I think they are trainable too, but they are just. I think they are just so intelligent and so independent. It's hard to. They are very independent. They're independent. They're also very quiet and um, they're they kind of relaxed. mysterious, yes, they aren't are. they? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hi, Zoe. You're such a pretty girl, and you've got such a big, fluffy mm -hmm. tail. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything that you would like to tell your mommy today? She wants to know if that man by the camera is going to stay for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Are you staying for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> okay. She says, because he'll have to play with me if he does. <laughs> she is playful. It's conditional. I told you. She's very okay. playful. You're so sweet. You're such a sweet little girl. Give me back to your mommy. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you learned something today, something that is very uplifting and that you will enjoy. Um, certainly, it changes your life when you have an animal. And when you see an animal as an equal being, it changes your life even more and brings great pleasure to you um, and to the animals. And they feel more welcome with you and more comfortable. Enjoy your animals and your life. Thank you. Thanks, Agnes. Once you open your awareness to animals, your consciousness will raise. And when that happens, 
you will be different. You will be open to love. Once you open yourself to love, wonderful things happen to you, your family, and to everyone. Thank you very much.